thank you, Lord, that you have given us this day. And we ask that your word will go out to wherever they can hear it. Either they're hearing it now live or they're going to hear it later. But even out into in, this body, Lord, and it won't come back void. That it will prosper everything you want it to do. Lord, work through me in this and take me out of the equation like that bad joke I told. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> uh, I did go see Mary yesterday, and, uh, and I got to say I was blessed by going to see Mary. Uh, there was a lot of love there, and you never know what to say to folks. when, And we know how much suffering Mary has been going through. But she has a beautiful faith, a beautiful faith in the Lord. And that blessed me to no end. And yeah, she misses John, and she... This is Ronnie, but she knows that God will see her through. I think it's a lesson for each and every one of us. She's an example for me, because I don't know what I, I don't know what she's going through. And, but to see how she's going through it, see how the Lord is carrying her, it was a blessing. So let's get into the Word. Then. Today we're going to finish up Ephesians chapter one, and we're going to start backing up into chap, uh, verse thirteen. And it says in verse 13 and 14, And in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance upon the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I'm going to take three points out of these verses. One, the word of truth. Two, the gospel of, of our salvation. And three, the guarantee. First is the word of truth. So let me tell you, in Greek, word means, the word for word, I've been trying to work on this all morning, the word for word, you know. The word for word in this particular instance, in this, in this verse, is logos which means a saying of God, decree, mandate, order, a moral prefect given by God, Old Testament prophecy given to prophets, and teaching and doctrine. And there's a whole list of other definitions, but as it pertains to the verses that we are reading, this is one of God. There's a verse that we're familiar with that, we, uh, that we've read many times, that also uses the word logos. And it's in John 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Of course, we're talking about Jesus Christ, who's called the Word. If you turn it around, you say, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos is God. It's the same word being used here. First question is, it says that it's the Word of Truth. There was somebody that asked, what is truth? right before he condemned Jesus to death. And that we know is Pontius Pilate. So turn to John 18, 37. Pilate therefore said to him, are you the king? And Jesus answered, you rightly, you rightly, you say rightly that I am the king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And remember in other passages, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And Pastor Martin was going through the, the doctrine of election and how many people were called and how people were predestined and how many people turned to Christ. And we went through that whole thing. Well, this is all part of it. My sheep Hear my voice, Jesus says. The word of God 
is Jesus' word. At the end of this, and I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Pilate looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? Clearly, he didn't know what the truth was going to be. Because had he had known what the truth was, I don't think he would have pronounced sentence on Jesus. Because he walks out there and says, I find no guilt in this man. But yet, as the crowd screams, crucify him, he, he relents. And he says, crucify him. And why I bring that up today, because today, more than any other time that I know in history, the truth is important. There is so much deception outside today. And we'll get into that. Jesus defines what truth is. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus doesn't say, I am one of the ways. I am one of the truths. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. He doesn't say that. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. And I don't mean to criticize all the religions. But all other religions are the wrong way. What's going on in this country? We've seen an increase in witchcraft. We just had a president that the witches used to, used to cast spell on them every time, every chance they can get. Out of Brooklyn. Why Brooklyn? <laughs> Why are the witches in Brooklyn? <laughs> I have a soft spot for where I was born. But it's going on. Just like the first advent, there was a lot of witchcraft, a lot of sorcery, a lot of demon possession in the world back then. And we're going to get into all the spiritual warfare and how it attacks not only our families, it attacks ourselves, it attacks us through illness, it attacks us through family problems. It's attacking the body of Christ. But why? So that we don't spread the word of truth. Keep us occupied. Keep me worrying about my problems. Just like when I went to go see Mary. She blessed me. I didn't bless her. I was so blessed by her faith, her beautiful faith, that when I went going to share with his sister to comfort his sister, that I ended up getting blessed. In our schools, our public schools, in our university and in our culture, they are trying to teach this very concept. That your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. I got an opinion, so I'm right, and, and you're right in your opinion. But we both can't be right, can we? This is insanity, even to the point. And you know, whenever the devil wants to do something, he caught on something really good. He said, let's say it's racist. In Oregon, they're trying to pass a law in the public schools that one plus one doesn't equal two anymore. Yeah, right? Two plus two doesn't equal four. I'm going to Oregon. Because when I go to the grocery store and I run up a bill of $260, I'm going to tell them, you're wrong. It's 150 so, Right? Right? Nobody got something against Italians? Are you racist? You know? I mean, think about it. Think about how insane that is. But it's not. It's all a mechanism to get our young people and our people that don't know the Lord to start thinking that their truth is the truth. Because if you can do it to science, then you can do it to everything. And if you notice everything going out there, it is not based on logic. It is based on fear and emotion. There was a church up in the uh, San Francisco area that did not believe and was not going to refer, was affirm homosexual lifestyle. So they tried to burn it down. What happened to your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Goes out the window 
when it goes against what they believe is truth, what their feelings say. It's a dangerous time that we're living in, but we need to stand on the truth. All truth begins and ends with God. And the Bible is true because it's God's word. Now I know this is circular reasoning. And most of the time it's used by people that don't have an answer or don't have any proof. They'll say, you know, well, it happened because it, we needed it to happen. It's like gravity. Well, how did gravity come about? Well, gravity made itself because the people on earth were going to need gravity. Circular reasoning. The truth ends and begins with God, and the Bible is true because it's God's word. The difference here is we have unshakable proof. We walk by faith, not by sight, but our faith isn't blind. We have proof. Prophecy. Prophecy in the Bible. The fact that God sees history in advance. He sees the future in advance. He tells us what's going to happen before it happens. Just like what came to mind was in Isaiah 17. talks about the destruction of Damascus in Syria. Damascus has never been totally destroyed. Damascus is one of the oldest cities in the world. God's word said it's going to be destroyed. Now, I'm not a prophet and I'm not a date setter. But all I know, if you look at Israel and look at the Middle East, you see things starting to work its way in that direction. You see Russia pulling out because of finances. You see Iran pulling in in the same areas in Damascus and surrounding Israel. We're seeing activity go on. And then if you eliminate Trump, and I'm not trying to get political here, if you eliminate Trump as president, who was pro-Israel, you have a recipe that may come to pass soon, or may not. It may be later. It's all in God's timing. But that's one way how we prove that the word of God is true. The miracles that Jesus did while he was on earth, the casting out of demons, the breaking the chains of those demons, the healing the blind, the lame, the sick, the brokenhearted, the miracles of a changed life is proof that the word of God is true. Because it changed my life. It changed me drastically. And it wasn't like something that somebody told me. Then someone didn't come up and tell me, you know, Jerry, you got a big empty hole God whole in your heart and only God can fill it. They read the word of God. The word of God is what pierced this black heart. The word of God is what turned me and convicted me and turned me to God. Not man's word. And then the ultimate proof. The resurrection. Not only was there 500 eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection, but the 11 saw him. And not only that, that many intelligent men and scholars and, and attorneys tried to prove that the resurrection was wrong. One, Dr. Simon Greenleaf. And I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again because if there's anybody out there hearing it. Simon Greenleaf was a Harvard professor. He ran the Harvard Legal Department. He is the father of the rule of evidence. To this day, we use his rule of evidence. You can't present evidence to the court unless it's in accordance with Simon Greenleaf. Simon Greenleaf had three students in his class, and they said to him, Professor, of course, one day he was mocking the resurrection. He said, Professor, why don't we put the resurrection on trial? And he thought about it and thought about it, and he did. This is Dr. Simon Greenleaf, the devout atheist, puts the resurrection on trial. The devout Christian, Simon Greenleaf, comes up with the conclusion 
that there is enough evidence, both secular and biblical, to prove that the resurrection was an actual event in history. Simon Greenlee spent the rest of his life as a Christian. One of the main things he said, it was amazing how you had 11 men shivering in their boots up in an upper room. And the women went down to tend to Jesus on the third day. Go men. (laughs) And they were wondering who was going to remove the rock, right? (laughs) And the angel came down to open the rock. Not so Jesus could get out, but so they could look in. And these women witnessed the resurrection. And without the resurrection, we're like any other religion. If Jesus didn't rise, then we're just fooling ourselves. But here's what Simon Greenleaf saw. He seen 11 men shaking in their boots, right? Wondering when they were going to be next to be crucified. And then, after the third day, these men go out boldly preaching the gospel. And on the 50th day, 3,000 believers come by the preaching of the man who denied Christ to begin with, and that's Simon Peter. And Simon Greenleaf said, it's impossible. It wasn't just one of them, it was all of them. And all of them, except for John, were martyred for their faith. And he said, nobody would die for a lie. That was one of the proofs. There was many other proofs. But one day they're shivering in their boots. The next day they're boldly professing the gospel of salvation. In Matthew 24, 35, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word by no means pass will pass away. That leads us to the gospel of salvation. In Romans 1, 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just will live by faith. And I'll tell you again, it's not blind faith. Romans 8.15, Pastor Martin read this last week, but I'd like to read it again, because I think we need to hear it. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We cry out to God as our daddy. The Spirit himself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God. And join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Last song that we sang, talking about the armies of God. You are the armies of God. As it was prayed that we would be as James says, doers of the word, not just speakers of the word. Army of God, you're commanded to be doers. In Romans 1, 18, it says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifested in them. Paul is talking about everybody. And when we talk about election, and we're talking about being called, and we're talking about who was selected, who wasn't selected, everybody has been called. Because what can be known about God is manifested in each and every one of us. The word manifest in Greek means, it's the word phananos. It means apparent, evident, 
manifested, to be plainly recognized or known. So when someone says to you, well, you know, I, don't, I just don't feel this God thing, that's because they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. The only thing that's going to change them is not your words. It's not telling them, well, you know, you got this big, empty, God, empty hole in you that only God can fill. No, it's listening to the word of God. That's part of it. None of us can be complete without God. And us not believing. Did you ever notice that people that don't believe in God and they want, it, they want us to affirm their lifestyle. I'm talking about all kinds of people. I'm not just talking about the homosexual community. All kinds of people. Whether it be a liar, whether it be an adulterer, whether it be a fornicator, whether it be somebody, they just want to run their own life. Please let me run my own life. Do you ever notice that they're never happy? There's never any joy in their life? And the reason why there isn't is because of what people say, that big, empty hole but only God can fill. Only God completes us. Amen? The rest of the verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, this in, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The ones who say, well, I'm not going to turn to God because look at the, uh, the natives in uh, Australia, the indigenous people. And I, they, nobody's talked to, you know. What could be known of God is in, manifested in them, like all of us. Our guarantee. Luke 11, 9 says, So I say to you, ask, And it will be given you. Seek, and you will be filled. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from from any father amongst you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a serpent? If you, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He's our down payment. Some, some have said it's our engagement ring for the bride of Christ. But we know, as Pastor Martin read last week, that nothing, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 5 says, 2 Corinthians 5, Now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it's good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well-known to God, and I also trust are well-known to our conscience. What Paul is saying, that absent from the body, present with the Lord, knowing this, knowing who lives inside us also, that we should be well-pleasing to the Lord. If you believe in one saved, always saved, some people says it gives you a, you know, 
a justification to sin. Go on, I'm saved. You know, I can do. No, God doesn't say that. God is conforming you to the image of his son. Every day we're being sanctified. Every day we're being pressed. Some of the trials that we are going through is what's pressing us to be more faithful and more loving and less sinful. I know that while I'm in this body, sin has its way with me, but I'm not chained to sin anymore. The chain has been broken, as our, our praise and worship saying. Jesus Christ broke those chains. So whatever your chain is, it's broken. If it's fear of illness, it's broken. If it's drug addiction, it's broken. If it's pornography, it's broken. Whatever it may be, lying is broken. Stealing is broken. If you trust in Christ, all your chains are broken. All you need to do is just lean on him. He's gone through it already. He knows your pain. No one suffered more than he suffered. And he loves us. And he wants us. Each and every one of us. He wants us. So what does it say? For God is not slack like a man, but he wished that none should perish. Yeah, there is a calling on your heart. There's a calling on your family's heart. If there's somebody that you know that refuses to listen, Know that God is calling him. And you should continue to pray for that person and continue to witness to that person. Back to Ephesians 1.15, it says, Ephesians 1.15, we're going to go to 16. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love for the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, mentioning of you in my prayers. In these verses, Paul gives us, the church, an example concerning how the church should be praying for each other. Not just when our brothers and sisters are in need, but we should be praying for each other to, that they get spiritual growth, that evangelism would happen, that they would become more wise and wisdom be installed to them, and Strengthen them in the love of the saints. Remember, Ephesus is the church in chapter 2 of Revelation that lost their first love. It says that you're doing all these good things and you keep my work, you keep my name, you keep this, this, and this, but you lost your first love. And they lost the love not only of Christ, but also for the saints, the fellowship. They were doing things robotically, it has a picture of the social gospel church that we want to right all the wrongs. We want to do all this, but we're leaving out the main thing to it. We're leaving out Jesus. Yeah, we should right the wrongs. We should fight for social justice. But if we do it absent of Jesus, it's like feeding the poor and never mentioning Jesus to them. All you did was have somebody well fed to go to hell. You know, you're nice and full? Goodbye. You know. I mean, nobody knows the hour or day that we're going to be gone. We can get out, walk out of this church, and something happened to us. Constantly need to be witnessing. And also, without love, I don't believe that you can love others. This was a common practice for Paul. He prayed for the churches that he planted as well as the early church prayed for each other. In Colossians 1, starting in verse 3, it says, Colossians 1, 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice in Paul's writing, he always says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those, are, those who accuse us of having Three gods and, you know, three gods, they don't understand the Trinity. It's always give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and your love for, for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which... 
we heard before in the word of truth. We already touched on the church at Ephesus losing its first love, so I won't go over it again. I got ahead of my notes. <laughs> well, maybe God got ahead of me. <laughs> Bring it up now, not later. Wisdom. Ephesus 1, 17 and 18. Speak of the spirit of wisdom. Ephesus 1, 17. That the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint? You notice Paul is praying that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge to know him. You've heard me mention this nine-week series about you. I'm not going to get off on that tantrum, but we don't come to church to know ourselves. We come to church to know God and Jesus Christ, his son. And I'll tell you something. When you learn about God and Jesus Christ, you'll learn about yourself. Like in this heart, <laughs> who can judge the heart? It's so desperately wicked. My wife and I were joking. I talked about um, David Hawkins. He was giving a message one day, and he was talking about how wicked the heart was. And he looked at this group of people and said, if you knew what was in that person's heart, you'd jump up and run away. And the person started laughing. Yeah, and they knew what was in your heart, you'd jump up and run away. Our heart is, there is wickedness in our heart. And that's why we need Jesus Christ. Because I don't believe there is love without Jesus Christ. All wisdom and knowledge, this may be circular reasoning again, begin and end with God. One of the verses, one of the, the Proverbs, Proverbs 8 is one of my favorite pro pro Proverbs. Let me read it. It talks about wisdom. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on the top of the hill beside the way where the path meets. She cries out by the gate at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the door, to you, O oh man, say, and woman. I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O oh, you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come the right things, for my mouth will speak truth. There it is again. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. And they are all plain to him who knows and understands and, and right to those who find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold for wisdom is better than rubies and all the things one may desire cannot compare to her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogance and evil ways and the perverse mount I hate. Counsel is mine, sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles. All the judges of the earth, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honors are with me. And I believe he's talking about spiritual riches, rich, riches and honors. Not the witches. We talked about them earlier. <laughs> Enduring riches of fine gold. 
My revenue, then choice silver. I travail in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the past of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, that I may fill their treasures. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before this, before his work of old, I had been established everlasting. From the beginning, before there was even an earth, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. All things that were made were made through him. Sounds a little bit like that. When there was no depth, I brought forth. When there was no foundation abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as of yet he had not made the earth or the field of primal, or prim, primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew the circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the foundations of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limits, so that the waters could not transgress his command, except if we get global warming and the ice melts, and then we're all going to be flooded, right? I'm being sarcastic. It doesn't say that. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as the master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the son of men. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear my instructions and be wise. Do not disdain it. Blessed is he. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gate, waiting for the post of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. I believe they're talking about the second death. There's the wisdom of the Bible and there's the wisdom of the world. And God tells us about the wisdom of the world in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He tells us how foolish it is. And he tells us who is perishing and what they think of, of the cross when they're perishing. And it says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Think about it, that atheists have mocked the crucifixion, the sacrifice that Mary talked about, the one and, full and last sacrifice, him shedding of his blood so that humanity could live. Because without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. And Jesus gave it all up for us. So that we can have life eternity. Those riches he was talking about is the share in his inheritance, as Pastor Martin talked about yesterday, uh, last week. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, through the world through wisdom did not know God. And it pleased God through foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Reminds me of those folks that believe in evolution and how something can happen from nothing. But if you talk to them about God speaking light into the world, they think you're, you're out of your mind. Back to Ephesus 1.19, and we're going to go, this is the last few verses of this chapter. Ephesus 1.19. 
And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of, the, of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Far above all principalities and might and dominions, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and that is us. Psalm 110, 1 and 2 says, the Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That's where the Lord is today. That's where we know is they're waiting for us. And I know of people that witnessed heaven opening up and calling them at, at the time that they're ready to go. We have nothing to fear. So if God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is with us, who can be against us? Nobody. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Who can be against us? Who should we fear? There's nothing man can do to us. Nothing illness can do to us. The chains that we have on, we can just put them off by accepting Jesus Christ. Who shall we fear? Romans 8, 7 says, Because the cardinal mind is enemy with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor needs to be, so that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. You hear what it's saying to us? Sin doesn't rule over us anymore. Whatever the sin is, that chain has been broken the minute you accept Jesus Christ. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body through, the, through His Spirit who dwells in you. Once again, I'll ask you, if God be for us, who can come against us? No one. Amen. So I'm going to read Romans 8.31 again. Because we all need to hear this. We all need to know that there's nothing to fear. Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, I think that's where I got it. If God is for us, who can come against us? <laughs> he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he is risen. Amen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution... Famine, nakedness, peril, sword. It is written, for your sake we are killed day by day. We are accounted like sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all things, we are made more than conquerors through him who loves us. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. If you are being condemned... By anything that you're doing, know that is of the devil. That is not of Christ. Turn to Christ. There is no condemnation. 
Sometimes I feel rotten inside. I said, Jerry, how can you? Jerry, you know. But that's the devil talking. Because here's what I do. I go to John 1, 8 and 9. For if you confess your sins, he is just and faithful to forgive them. Nothing I can do. He does it all. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angel nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. That's the devil. And his minions shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Love of God, it says. Which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Take that home with you today, church. Remember that daily. Read it if you have to daily. If God be for you, no one is, can be against you. He can try, and they will try. They will try to torment us day and night so we stop preaching the word. But as the word says, resist the devil and he will flee. All it does is make us stronger. It makes us like Mary. Not you, Mary, the other Mary. <laughs> makes us like Mary. A woman that lost so much, but yet still hangs on the one and only thing that you can hang on. Can't hang on to your job. You can't hang on to your bank account. You can't hang on to your car, your house, and other people, right? That's true. You can't hang on to those things. When troubles come, when attacks come, when those flaming darts from the enemy comes, you hang on Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word of truth. We thank you for the gospel of our salvation, Lord. We thank you for our guarantee, the Holy Spirit who lives within us, Lord. Lord, I pray from the sound of my voice, or if anyone's going to hear this later on, if there is anyone who does not know you, and as your word says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. There's no magic formula, no magic prayer, Lord. You want all to be with you. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.